If I die, tell your mom. She's waiting her talent at the post office. You got a concussion? What are the expectations or different parameters for how um, for how you're doing the show and moving from Comedy Central to HBO Warner Brothers? And how was that accomplished? We, we didn't really change our process as much as you would think. I mean, like, we always wrote the show as we felt was the funniest way to write it when it was on Comedy Central. We just knew that they were going to bleep out the bad words and whatever. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so really, it's it's the same show. It runs a little bit longer. You know, we don't have to cut it off abruptly 21 and a half minutes in. You know, some episodes are 25 minutes. I think one episode might be about 36 minutes, but I don't think you feel the length because it's right. it's a lot of fun. And truthfully, I think that when we were closer to 22 minutes, there were whole storylines that we cut out, you know, and there were whole moments within the scenes that I felt felt a little truncated that could have, you know, they could have benefited from a little bit more air to breathe, sure. um, if that makes sense. So yeah, sure. now, we, now we let scenes play out the way that we sort of really think is in our best favor. Right. Trust me, we don't let something become very like pacey and slow. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're having a great time. The HBO Max, it gives us more creative freedom. And it also just is where the eyeballs are, you know, because there are a lot of people out here who don't do uh, broadcast TV anymore and they don't do cable, but everybody has a phone and everybody has apps. And so they can watch us on their phone at 3 a.m. in the morning in bed, you know, so long as they're not waking their spouse. Um, you can tell this is when I watch a lot of my TV. Um, so that's, that's what's great about HBO Max. It's more freedom and it's more viewers. Cool. So you're from Atlanta and Bashir is from the South Side proper. He's from Ch South Side Chicago. And by the way, let me just say, I'm the interloper. All of our series regulars are from the South Side Chicago. Cool. Almost all of our uh, writers are from the South Side Chicago. We got one North Sider, one straight up the Burbs. And then uh, Michael Blyden is from, uh, he's from Detroit. Cool. But that he's still got that Midwestern flavor. Oh, sure. Truly, I'm the only interloper because I was raised in Atlanta, <laughs> but uh, we're not going to hold that against me yet. Well, <laughs> I, I was going to ask, what does your flavor add to his native roots? And when has he had to step in and show his Chicago badge as you were developing? <laughs> no, there's no badges. We ain't got no stinking badges. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you know what's actually interesting about that is that um, before we had this show, we were working on a show about Atlanta for HBO. And uh, when I would take him around my hometown of Atlanta, he'd be like, hey, what's that? Or why is that like that? Or, you know, like he would ask questions. And to me, that was always fuel for, well, we should do an episode about that because you as an outsider are noticing things that I would probably just not even think was that weird. And so I would play that role on Southside. I would just oh, say sure. like, you know, what I've noticed is A, B, and C. And then we'd be like, okay, why don't we put that into an episode? So what do you love specifically about the characters in the show as far as how you treat them, despite their different levels of socioeconomic participation in life? Well, we, we I, first off, I'd say we love all the characters. And I think that they all represent what is, what is very true, which is that if you go to the South Side of Chicago, or honestly, if you go to the South Bronx, if you go to South Central LA or, or Southwest Atlanta, you'll always find these people who are like, yeah, I'm an elementary school, teacher but i also sell these vegan cookies on the side you know like everybody else everybody's looking for a better lot in life um i've always thought it was really um <laughs> i've always thought it was really interesting that there was this stereotype that somehow people you know lower working lower uh, lower middle class uh working class people are somehow looking for a handout i've never known that to be the case i can't i, I cannot point that out to you growing up it seemed like everybody was hustling as hard as they could to try and have more than what they had. Um, and so, again, I think sometimes these stereotypes come from people who just don't, aren't from those neighborhoods. You know, exactly. you look at their background, they're not from the neighborhood, they're, they're watching the news, so they think everything that happens in the South Side of Chicago is just all violence. Well, you know what? I always make the joke that, you know, I've never really been to Wall Street, but based on what I've heard in the news, it's a bunch of crooks stealing money. I'd say send the cops down there, because it's all... Listen, anything you see on the news, the news is always going to be primarily bad stuff. It's, yeah. it's rare that you get a lot of good news. If it bleeds, it leads. You know, take it from people who are actually from these communities. If you ask somebody, you know, are you from the South Side? Yes. Do you think it has its challenges? Absolutely. Do you love the South Side? I love it. Now, how could somebody love it if it was death, chaos, and mayhem all the time? It's impossible. The fact is, is that this is where these people 
find love, where they find laughter, it's where their family and their friends live. And just like anybody else's hometown, you're going to love it. The humor is smart, fast, and funny. Did you and Bashir have a template when you created as far as a sitcom or a YouTube programming trend or something you liked no, as a kid when you were no, creating it? No, we, we did not go in with a template, but what we did go in with was a process. And our process was that we're going to write it as funny as we can, and then we're going to revise, 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 and then we're going to bring it at some of our funniest people, and then they're going to help us revise and revise some more. And then on the day that we're shooting it, we're still going to have, we're still going to try some improv. We're still going to try some revisions on the day of, and sometimes those things aren't as funny as we've written, and sometimes they're hilarious. They're they're they're, they're funny in ways that we could have never predicted, and then sometimes they'll even change a whole scene. You know, like all of a sudden you'll be like oh my gosh, when we wrote this, we didn't realize that this was, it's easy to overthink it and become intellectualized, but like, <laughs> you know, like you'll just be like, oh my gosh, you know, this is a scene about Quincy, the manager of the store and Kay who works at the store, but this has really become labor versus management tearing a family apart, you know? like, And sometimes you just can't even see that until you stand it up on its feet, so to speak. Absolutely. So it's, it's a process. And then by the way, in editing, you can make a decision and be like, oh my gosh, guys, this is not the scene that we shot or wrote, but if you place this line of dialogue at the top of the scene, it's gonna change the whole scene. And it's gonna make the whole scene that much funnier. We make those decisions too. So one yeah. of the funnier elements of the show is the news station you made up as a weird kind of Greek chorus. <laughs> How is the media yeah. letting down black Americans in your point of view? <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, Lauren Cohn's not letting us down. She's amazing, we yeah. love her. She's a she's a Chicago a real life yep. you know news lady from Chicago and she's great she she gives us just enough of that sort of like perfect disdain that sometimes falls off the the anchor's tongue and and our sort of running joke with that segment is no matter what good things happen in an episode of our show whatever is bad I think one of the episodes like you know it's like character helps another character character helps another character and then there's like a fight at a party. And then you cut to Lauren Cohen saying tragedy on the South side where a fight <laughs> broke out at a party, leaving one person in the hospital. And, you know, that is to a certain extent how I feel like it's what I was saying earlier. It's like, it's all bad. It's always going to be all bad. And, uh, and well, so, I just like the yeah, device. The device <laughs> it's a great device. Yeah. Really she's is. actually the first person to speak at the top of season two is Lauren Cohen. Right. She's she's once again saying, you know, <laughs> something bad has happened on the South Side. So we you talked about writing for Jimmy Fallon for a time before he went to the Tonight Show. What is your what is the landscape and your observation of the late night shows at eleven thirty five with the two Jimmys and the Steven? And why do you think all three fit in the landscape the way they do? I'm just kind of I think they I think they're all just really wonderful at what they do. I mean, like you know, I I. I loved the Colbert Report uh, when it was on Comedy Central. I used to think that show was so funny. Yeah. And uh, it took me a second to get used to just seeing Steven play Steven. But at this point, like, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Like, my, my kid has adopted watching this, <laughs> the, the, the Stephen Col the late show with Stephen Colbert. And it's funny for him to watch it, for me to watch him watching it, because he doesn't even know about the old Colbert Report. Sure. Um, so so I think I think that's I think Kimmel is probably the closest thing to what Letterman did. You know, he doesn't have a, a thing, but he gets out there and he engages in, 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 in talk. And I think that's really cool. And then obviously Fallon is like he's, he's a dear friend and he's a buddy. And I think one of the truest things I've ever heard about Fallon is, is what uh, is what Kimmel said about him in the very beginning, which is that he's like an amazing athlete because he can run. He can jump, he can right. play the guitar, he can do impressions. Uh, he does everything. He does literally everything on that show every night. Uh, Jimmy's the consummate professional. He's a consummate friend. I mean, like, I feel like he supports us in whatever we do. And uh, and every now and then we'll get a, a phone call or an email, you know, with the subject line is one of the is one of the jokes from one of our shows. So we've, <laughs> we've all stayed in touch. Can I also say, I love this new generation. I love Jesus and Mero. I think they're outstanding and funny. I love Amber Ruffin's show. I yes, think she's really Amber's great. great. You know, um, there, there are a lot of people who are sort of like in the new gen. Working with the president, uh, President Obama, what surprised you about him that you didn't expect before you met him? Look, I, I knew the guy could tell a joke, but I didn't know he was going to be like he had better timing than some of the comedians who'd come on Jimmy Fallon. No joke. I mean, wow. you know, even Jimmy, even Jimmy sort of recognized it. Cause like 
you know, sometimes you put this script into the hands of certain people and and they're and they're terrible. You're just like, oh, man, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to coach him on being funny. That was not the case with Barack. He it, we did what was called a cold read, which is just you put the script in his hand, he reads it out loud. It's literally just Jimmy Fallon, me and Bashir, and about 50 Secret Service guys standing around. Not not the ideal audience for comedy. Um, they're sort of paid not to laugh or smile. Um, <laughs> but you know, like the the second the words that oddly enough came out of this brain and this thing were coming out of his mouth, that was that was surreal. Yeah, um, it's just like, oh, I know exactly where, where this where this train of thought's going. Um, you know, he had us laughing, that's, and then you know, the White House photographer took a picture, a pretty famous picture. Um, where you can see Bashir and Jimmy and a couple of members of the Roots and uh, the president all laughing. And then there's one person who's got his head turned completely to the side. And that idiot's name is me. I was so happy that we actually got a couple of the Secret Service guys over here to laugh. That like, I, I just instinctively were like, oh, they're laughing. And then they took this picture and it's in this big bound book now. And I am... I'm literally the head that's turned. And it's 99% faces turned to the camera. I'm like this. So, you know, I just always, I got to go my own way, man. I got to go my own way. Last question. You yeah. grew up in a big family as I did. How do you think that experience prepares you better for the world or maybe makes it worse? Uh, I think it can make you better because you learn immediately that you're not the only person in the world. I know some some only children who I'm like, you're not an only child for your whole life. But, you know, I actually had the best of both worlds because I came, I was six, I was the last, but I came about 10 years after, excuse me, I came about 10 years after number five. And so that was a huge, that made a big difference because that meant I was never really competing for attention or resources. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yes. some, of, some of the older kids, like there was only about a year and a half apart. So you're naturally going to be competing with this person who's barely taller than you, barely older than you. No, I, I came along like they were almost like uncles and aunts who were like seeing right. other adults. And so I had like I had all the kid attention. So I think I sort of lucked out in the best way in, the, in that I, I knew I wasn't the only person in the world, but I still got enough attention that uh, I feel like uh, I, I, I think I came out fully formed. That's not true. I'm still figuring myself out. By the way, is there any special guests you'd like to see on Southside? If I can just put this out there in the universe, Sherman Showcase, season two, I want to have Jeffrey Wright and Coleman Domingo uh, from Fear the Walking Dead. Those are my two favorite uh, guys right now. And I just, I, I, I'll we'll make it work. Whatever you guys want to do on the show, let's do it. You got it. All right, my friend. Have a Take great care. day and congratulations. Today is premiere day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick. I appreciate yep. it. Rock and roll. Nice. This is Patrick McDonald for HollywoodChicago.com, copyright 2021.